Hi everybody, welcome back to the 10th of an hour with Griffin Bridgers. For today's episode, episode 34, we're going to look at some of the pitfalls of a little known doctrine that can apply in a situation where multiple trusts are created by the same clients or parties, and that is known as the reciprocal trust doctrine. As we're going to see, this can have tax implications and even possibly creditor protection implications. But it could also be a valuable tool in certain circumstances as well. So this is a double-edged sword, and we'll see why in today's presentation. Now, as always, this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice. So what are reciprocal trusts? We'll look at the uh, plain English definition in a minute, but for the time being, this was a doctrine developed really in tax arguments, and uh, the IRS has adopted the position from the U.S. Supreme Court opinion in Grace versus United States, which says that reciprocal trusts are an arrangement to the extent of mutual value which leaves the trust settlers in approximately the same economic position as they would have been if they created trusts naming themselves as life beneficiaries. Now, I want to call out the piece, uh, or a couple pieces here. One is approximately, and the other is life beneficiaries. As we're going to see, this doctrine has kind of been extended to apply not only in a case where they could be life beneficiaries, but also potentially in control of transferred assets. So what are reciprocal trusts in plain English? This is simply any arrangement where two or more trusts are created at the same time and there are interrelated parties and the trusts are largely identical to each other as well. So some common examples might be where a spouse as settlor creates a trust for the other spouse and names the other spouse as trustee and vice versa. That other spouse also creates a trust for the first spouse. So you might see this in a situation where they're creating spousal lifetime access trusts or slats or any sort of like islet or insurance trust created at the same time with simultaneously purchased policies. Another situation that can arise is where a settlor creates gifting trusts, irrevocable trusts for children, and names children not necessarily as trustees of their own trust, but as cross-trustees for each other. So if you had two siblings, one sibling might be the trustee of the other's trust, and vice versa. And these are very important right now because we're in a situation where with the high gifting exemption, a lot of people are going to be trying to make gifts to trusts, and they're going to be trying to do it in a hurry before the election comes up. So if the law changes, they can take advantage of the higher exemption before it goes away. But there is some caution to be taken there with simultaneous gifts and simultaneously created trusts. And look at how you can avoid some of these issues in a minute, but for the first uh, piece, I wanna focus on the costs of this issue. Now, originally, the reciprocal trust doctrine was a tax doctrine, and from a tax perspective, the effect is that the IRS can uncross the trusts. Now, the uncrossing of the trusts isn't necessarily a bad outcome unless it leads to one of the following. One, it can lead to a situation where a settlor, after the uncrossing of the trust, could be a trustee and or beneficiary of a reciprocal trust. That goes back to that life beneficiary piece I mentioned at the beginning. And as a result of this uncrossing, it results in retained use control and or reversion of the settlor, which causes all of the trust assets to be included in the settlor's gross estate for estate tax purposes at death. Another bad outcome is that it could cause a beneficiary to be named trustee of their own trust, which could result in a general power of appointment under Code Section 2041 if the distribution standards in the trust aren't sufficiently limited. Now, I want to call out right now that with the very high estate tax exemption amount, this is only a bad result under current law if the combined value of the decedent's gross estate before including the, the trust assets and the gross estate after including the trust assets would exceed the $11.58 million estate tax exclusion. Otherwise, there's no tax issue here. You get a free unintended step up in basis for trust assets. So for estates being administered right now, it might be a good idea to look back and see if there's any 
argument you can make to state that there are reciprocal trusts on, for example, an estate tax return, because that could give you a free step up in basis without causing any estate tax liability under current law. So with the exemption being as high as it is, this is a double-edged sword. Now, another issue that can arise, especially during the life of a settlor instead of at death, or the life of a beneficiary instead of at death, would be the creditor protection argument. Uh, this isn't as well developed as the IRS type of doctrine, but a creditor could also seek to uncross trusts that are deemed to be reciprocal. So the net effect would be, for example, one, a settlor could be treated, treated as creating a self-settled trust, which is void against current and or future creditors depending on state law. Another issue is that a beneficiary could be treated as holding a general power of appointment, the exercise of which could be compelled by a creditor depending on state law. And I call out depending on state law because Colorado doesn't necessarily treat things fully this way. On, on number one, a self-settled trust in Colorado is only void against current creditors and the question is up in the air as to whether it's void against future creditors and similarly under Colorado law a beneficiary who holds a general power of appointment can't be compelled to exercise that power of appointment but that issue largely depends on where the beneficiary is located too. If the beneficiary is in another state and the trust is a Colorado trust the protection of that principle may not apply. Now, of course, both of these arguments fall second to any sort of fraudulent transfer argument that could be made by a creditor as well. Now, I'm not going to really get into that, but what's important here is how do you avoid the reciprocal trust doctrine applying? Now, none of these are necessarily facts and circumstances that can be looked at in a bubble, nor do all of these necessarily have to be included in a trust, but all of these together generally create the safe harbor that is followed. One is that you don't create trusts at the same time. Now, even if you don't do this, it's important to note that the IRS could still come back and make a, a step transaction argument or even an economic substance argument, even, you know, or especially when there's business related transfers, like with a family limited partnership. So that aside, it's also important to create uh, trusts that don't necessarily have similar terms when created close in time or even are funded with similar amounts. So if you're, if you're going to gift one million per child, it might not be a good idea to put one million into each separate trust. You might want to vary the gifts a bit and then equalize them at a later time. Another issue is not to name reciprocal trustees. You don't want husband and wife as settlor and trustee and vice versa, or maybe siblings as cross trustees for each other, as I mentioned. And then in the rare event that these are uncrossed, one way you can avoid any issue is by not granting an interested trustee the power to distribute in excess of an ascertainable standard, such as health, education, maintenance, support, so on and so forth. Because if the trusts are uncrossed, especially in a situation where maybe you have siblings as cross trustees, there is no general power of appointment issue as long as you limit the discretionary distribution standards. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of the 10th of an hour, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.